Adam Ribeiro. And the reason we do that is because we believe that the Bible teaches that the promises that are given to God's people extends to their children. It doesn't mean that we it guarantees any salvation, certainly because of me or the water or because of anything in him, but it's a promise that's given that we can trust that he is God's child. But it, what it also means for the parents, and this includes those who are here, adults, as we care for one another's children. It means that we teach our children, so we teach Kayo to keep and to do God's word. So knowing God's word and obeying it, understanding that the scripture teaches that he has a savior in Jesus. Also, it's a commitment that you will pray with and for your children. Pray together and with your children for them and for their love for him. And also it means for you, Paulo and Laura, that you set an example to Cayo in love and godliness. And that at work and at play and at school and all that, they, that he does as he grows, he needs, like you do, God's grace. So I want to ask you these questions, Paulo and Laura. First, do you acknowledge Cayo Adams' need for the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? If so, then yes, I do. Do you claim God's covenant promises on his behalf and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ to be his salvation as you do for your own? If so, yes, I do. Do you now commit Cayo to God and seek to be for him a godly example? that you will pray with and for him, that you will teach him about God and his word, that you will strive by all the means of God's grace to bring him up in the care and teaching of the Lord. If so, then yes, by the grace of God, I do. Okay. I'm going to pray for you all. And while, uh, before I pray, I'm going to ask the elders of Midtown Church and also any ruling or teaching elders in, uh, in our church worshiping with us today, please come and gather around the Ribeiro family. Let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for this family, Lord, that that, that has been dear to me, to Alice, for years. And Lord, the blessing that they have been to us and their children. We thank you that your spirit dwells in their home and in their family. Lord, and I pray that you would protect them from the evil one who seeks to divide and frustrate. I pray, Lord, that they would look to you like we all need to do as the author and finisher of their faith. I pray that they would be faithful. And Lord, none of us as parents are perfect, and our children know that more than anyone else. But Lord, I pray that they would be diligent in demonstrating your goodness, and speaking of your truth to Kaya. And Lord, that all the days of his life, he would know that he has a Savior. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, Kaya. Come on. All right. So this is Kaya, Adam, Ribeiro, and the name Kaya means, in Latin, joy or rejoicing, which is a wonderful name uh, for this time of year, this time of season. Actually, he was born, uh, his birthday was just a few days ago. What was his birthday? On Thanksgiving. His birthday was on Thanksgiving, a day of rejoicing. I'm reminded of the scripture in Philippians, rejoice in all things, to rejoice in all things, and what is not excluded from that commandment is to rejoice in times of sorrow. And that's one of the tensions that we see in Scripture. That we're commanded, we're exhorted, even in times of sadness, even in times of sorrow, that there is a rejoicing that we can have that is different than happiness because it goes deeper. It's a rejoicing in what the Lord has done and His promises that He will be faithful to His people. And that all that has been broken will be made right. And that's where our joy can come from. So, Kayo, our hope and prayer for you is that even when challenges and hardships come, that you would be able to rejoice. And that as you grow, others who see you rejoicing would ask the question, Kayo, 
I know you just went through a hard time, but yet you still seem to have joy. And you can have an opportunity to tell them why. That's our hope. His, his middle name is Adam. And the part of the reason that he can rejoice, and we all can, is not because of the first Adam, right, who created all the problems, but when we think of Cairo, we want to think of the second Adam, right? The second Adam that it talks about in Romans, who is Jesus. Jesus is the second Adam. And he has made right what Adam messed up, the first Adam. So that's our hope for you as you grow, that you would be a man who is committed to the second Adam. Kaio baptize you with this water here. But first, I want you to know, Caillou, that for you, God made the world. Did you know that? For you, God made the world. And for you, God became flesh in Jesus. And for you, God, as Jesus in the flesh, died on a cross. And for you, he rose from the dead. And for you, he is coming back again. That's good news. Cayo, Adam, Ribeiro, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yes, you can clap. Paulo and, Robor, Paulo and Laura picked out a scripture verse uh, as a banner for his life, and Laura, I believe, is going to go up and read that now. I want to invite uh, those who are members of Cayo's Covenant family, so friends, family, Midtown members, would you rise? Friends, family, church community, do you, being part of the Midtown Covenant community, and Cayo's Covenant community, un- do you undertake the responsibility of assisting Paulo and Laura in the Christian nurture of Cayo Adam? If so, then we do. We do. Amen. You may be seated. And you all may be seated as well, and I'm going to have Chad, who's going to pray for us.
Thanks, Chad. All right, I want to invite the uh, children, pre-K through second grade, pre-K through second grade, going to come up. All right, adults, what do we say to our children? Lord be with you. All right, go in peace, and we'll see you for the Lord's Supper. I invite uh, those of you who are still here, who didn't go with the kids, to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25, and uh, I know that we're covering a lot of laws, and that can feel redundant and even cumbersome, but... I want to remind you that the laws that are given to us, to God's people in the Old and New Testament, they're different than the laws that we have for our land in this sense. These laws reflect the character of God. They're not just telling us how to live. That, that in and of itself is good because God intends for us to flourish. He wants things to go well for His people. And He's given them instruction on how that would happen. But also, it's teaching his people, teaching us something about who he is, teaching us about his character. As we hear these laws, this is an opportunity for us to understand better who God is. About his character, about his virtues, about his mercy, about his care and concern for the oppressed. About how he intends to hold the world to a high standard, but also extend mercy. And we see that, of course, primarily at the cross. So Deuteronomy chapter 25, we're going to go down to verse 13. And we're going to read two, well, one law and then one story. One law and then a story. First I'm going to cover the law, and then we'll go to the story. So listen to this, this is the word of God, verse, starting in verse 13. You shall not have in your bag two kinds of weights, a large and a small. You shall not have in your house two kinds of measures, a large and a small. A full and fair weight you shall have, a full and fair measure you shall have, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. For all who do such things, all who act dishonestly, are an abomination to the Lord your God. And we'll pause there. Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much that you love us. We thank you that uh, you love us enough to give us direction and instruction, but also to reveal yourself to us, to show us a little bit more about who you are and your intentions of being in relationship with your people, with us. Help us to see this, to trust it. And also, Lord, how to apply the scripture this particular laws and this story, how to understand it and apply it to our living today. We need your spirit to do that. In your name we pray, amen. So, we all have been paying attention to the war in Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine, but something I was reading about recently that I hadn't paid much attention to is that within hours of Russia breaking into Ukraine, within hours of that, there were tons of email scams, internet scams, that went out across the world, across the globe, trying to take advantage of people using the war in the Ukraine as an opportunity. Two particular categories most of these scams fell into. One was charity, and the other was romance. So in romance, there were a lot of emails and websites set up broadcasting the opportunity to meet or host or help out lovely Ukrainian women who were struggling. But the other one, a lot more prolific that are still going on, are charity scams. Opportunities to give to help refugees escaping the war that are really going into people's pockets. The money never makes it to Ukraine. 
The money is dead is going to serve individuals who are using a horrible occurrence for their own benefit. One story I read recently was about a, a mother, Elena, and her daughter, Sasha. They were coming out of a, a town near the Black Sea. When the war started, her husband and son had to go to war and felt it was best for Elena and the nine-year-old daughter, Sasha, to escape. They traveled across Europe, were able to get um, a plane ticket to Canada, and paid for an organization in Canada, paid a large chunk of money, that when they arrived would provide transportation, housing, and boarding for several weeks while they could find something more long-term. When they arrived in Toronto, nobody showed up. Nobody was there. And they were left stranded at the, at the bus station. I think it was a train station. This is dishonorable to God. This is an abomination. This is somebody using war, vulnerability, for their selfish gain. And I wish this was a rare occurrence, but this happens all the time. Every disaster has these kind of stories. And that's what God is talking about here. Moses is speaking on behalf of God here about two dishonorable actions that humans tend to take. One is dishonorable business, and the other is dishonorable warfare or to expand dishonorable conflict. conflict. So in the first section that we just read, he's talking about having two sets of weights. So when you went to the store in the Old Testament, if you were an Israelite, you show up and you don't see little tags on what you want to buy, on a bag of grain or a piece of meat with the price on it. What you would do is you would collect it and the store owner would weigh it. And the weight determined how much you paid. And a dishonorable business owner could secretly adjust the weight by adding more weight in a secretive way. He could have two sets of weights, one that was true and one that was false, in order to trick his customers. And that is an abomination to God. And he makes very specific here that that kind of business transaction is not okay. And if you go back all the way to Leviticus 19, it's emphasized here. This isn't the first place it's brought up. In Leviticus chapter 19, verses 35 and 36, it says this, You shall do no wrong in judgment, in measures of length or weight or quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hen, which are ways that you would measure the weight of something. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and you shall observe all my statutes and all my rules and do them. I am the Lord. He's making note as he often does. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. I did that work. So when you go into the new land, I'm the one who determines how you should live. And then when it comes to business, when it comes to your dealings with one another, you do that in a right and just and fair way. Later in the book of Proverbs, many years later in the book of Proverbs, the wisdom books, 11, chapter 11, verse 1, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is, he, is His delight. What do we learn about God? That He intends, part of His character is that things are done fairly, that we treat one another fairly and not use a person, especially a person of great vulnerability to our selfish ends. God knew that that was going to be a thing. He knew that there was going to be a tendency before they even go into the land, that there was a tendency within humanity to use circumstances to their benefit, to cheat one another. And so God makes clear over and over again, be fair, be righteous, be just in your business dealings. But of course, God's people wouldn't do that. They didn't do it. So later when they suffer the consequences of their unrighteousness, 
In the book of Amos, the prophet points out an area, points out specifically this area is part of the reason why they suffered God's judgment. In chapter 8, it says this in verse 4 and following of Amos. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? In other words, why would you say, I'm waiting for this opportunity to take advantage? When will that time can't come? I can't wait till we can get back to our evil dealings. And the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale. In other words, I can't wait for the Sabbath to get over so that we can start cheating people again. That we, make, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances. That we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. He's condemning God's people for their what they were doing, taking advantage of all people, but the ones who suffer most, who are the most susceptible to being cheated are often the orphan, the widow, the sick, the elderly, the poor. They're the ones who receive the selfish transactions of evil business doers, business people. On December 25th, 2010, a number of high-level, wealthy business executives were arrested in Zurich. And I hate to say it, they were soccer enthusiasts. FIFA, for many, many years, the global representative of all soccer, World Cup soccer especially, right now, had done horrible things. They received bribe after bribe after bribe after bribe to the tune of $150 million. And even now, there's so much controversy about what's going on in Qatar. Documents that show, even now, after... Everybody in the world who pays attention to sports at all has paid attention to what's gone on with FIFA. Even after that, bribes have been made to land the World Cup in Qatar. And not only that, there's rumors, investigations going on now in Qatar about humans, human rights violations in building the stadiums and preparing for the World Cup. Who's been the most susceptible? Who's been the most vulnerable? Even to the point that many lives have been lost. The poor. The refugee. The immigrant. Who has been brought in from other countries to help build these massive stadiums. Y'all, I love soccer. But I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed at what that sport, as a business, has brought out of humankind. It's brought out unfair, unrighteous, unjust, abominable acts on humanity. And that is detestable to God. It's detestable. God intends that His kingdom would be run, would be operated according to what is right and just and fair. God intends that the world that He created would be run and operated even in a financial level to a family, to an institution like a, a university, medical, law, that all these careers and callings, institutions would be done in a way that brings pleasure to Him and reflects His goodness, His righteousness. But what we see every time we turn on the news is that humans twist that for their benefit. Why do they do that? Well, because at heart, humans do not fear God. We don't fear God. So I'm going to come back to that, but let's talk about the story first. So go down in Deuteronomy 25, and it's, it's interesting because 
We've just gone through chapters of law after law after law after law again that are good because they point us to God's character. And then all of a sudden here, in the middle of it, or towards the what I would say a bookmark here, there's a story. A reminder of something that happened in the history of God's people coming out of Egypt. One of the first horrific challenges that they experienced coming out of Egypt. Verse 17 tells that story. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way, on the way as you came out of Egypt? How he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail? Those who were lagging behind you and did not fear God? Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. What's he talking about? What's the story about Amalek and his followers, his people, his tribe, his nation, the Amalekites? Well, it goes back to something that is talked about vaguely or not very detailed in the book of Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 17, it tells the story of God's people coming out and pretty soon having a conflict with another tribe, another nation who attacked them. And in this story, they were eventually victorious, but they did suffer loss. And what happened was that the Amalekites came and attacked Israel at their most vulnerable moment. So they were coming out of Egypt didn't even have like a fully secured and ready and able army set up. They were coming out of Egypt, and that's when they were the most vulnerable, and the Amalekites struck then. But the other thing that the Amalekites did was that they struck at the most vulnerable point from behind. And God makes note that that was particularly detestable, that they would attack at their most vulnerable moment and at their most vulnerable point from behind where it is often the case that as you would travel the women and the children and the elderly would travel behind the men in front and the Malachites attacked from behind at their most vulnerable position Amalek was taking advantage of Israel at their most susceptible and again, that word vulnerable moment. We went to Arkansas <clears throat> to have Thanksgiving with my papa. He's 99 years old. He still gets around, but he's old. We were in Bella Vista, Arkansas. And every year that we go, he shows his age just a little bit more. He has to walk with a, with a walker. It takes him a long time even to get from the living room to the kitchen. Everything say you have to say it two or three times a little louder each time but right by the cabinet in the kitchen my papa has a red golf club I think it's a putter with the Alabama logo on it. I don't know why but he always makes clear if a robber comes in this house I'm gonna take that putter and I'm gonna beat the crap out of him just to make the rest of us feel safe, that my 99-year-old grandpa is going to beat a robber with a putter. And he'll say that several times during our time there. And that's funny, but it's sad. Because that's where his mind goes when his family is around. He wants to know that he can protect his loved ones. And that he needs to protect them. As a 99-year-old man, he is acutely aware that he is vulnerable to the vices of others. It's sad to me that that's what he has to think about on Thanksgiving, that he is vulnerable, and we are vulnerable, and that we need protection. But that's the world we live in, a world where people will take advantage of women and children and sick and elderly And why is it that the Amalekites would do this, as well as others? Use wartime as an opportunity to take advantage of others, to do damage, to take life. Why would they do that? Because business 
is war. War is business. It's about getting over on top of the others for your own benefit. I know today war is more complicated than merely business, but business is part of it. Well, even more so back then when a nation would attack another nation, it was for the benefit of the attacking nation. They wanted their stuff. I want your sheep. I want your people to be my slaves. I want your goats and your calves. I want your land. It was business, and the Amalekites were dealing in business and in war dishonorably. And while God recognizes that there is war in the land, God recognizes and points out, exhorts His people to deal honorably in business and in conflict, in war in particular. Now, if we were to meet an Amalekite, or let's say later in the life of Israel, because here's the thing, Israel was not faithful to this command. Israel didn't wipe out the Amalekites. And later, all throughout, matter of fact, all into the years later of the people of Israel, the Amalekites constantly were causing trouble. But let's say somebody ran into an Amalekite, and they had a conversation with them. And they say, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we're supposed to wipe you out because of what Amalek did. We're supposed to, um, you know, you're not supposed to be around here. You're, we're supposed to take you out because we remember what your people did. And let's say an Amalekite said, hey, you know, uh, well, here's the thing. Let me explain this to you. You might not understand this, but we don't believe in your God. So that's, that's, that's cool for you if you believe that. But see, as Amal- Amalekites, We believe something very different. We have a different God, a different religion. And so how dare you try to inflict your religion on us? How dare you try to say that you, in your patriarchal, patronizing, religious faith, how dare you try to put that on us? Hey, you be you, that's cool. But you got to let us be us, right? Well, here's the problem. That sounds good. That tickles the ears of our culture today. But here's the problem with that, that God's laws are meant for everybody. God's laws are not just meant for the Israelites. God's laws are not just meant for the followers of Yahweh and those who have bowed a knee to Jesus Christ. God's laws, God's ways are meant for the good of all of humanity. We cannot fall into this idea that the ways of God, the goodness that God intended by demonstrating His character, protecting the weak, caring for those who are in need, the orphan and the widow, or living righteously in our business dealings, or bringing justice on those who break the law. We c- We cannot say, nor can we fall into the temptation to say, oh, well, that's just for us, but not for others. All people created in the image of God are called to fear God and to live a life that is reflective of that fear of God. Why did the Amalekites do the things they do? Why would they do something so horrendous? Why would business owners cheat his fellow countrymen or an outsider? Why would one person cheat another? Why would a, an army general attack civilians? Why would these ha- things happen? Because people do not fear God. What does that look like? What does it look like to fear God? I want to talk, as I kind of move towards the conclusion, I want to talk about two things. One, what does it look like to fear God? And how can we grow as followers of Jesus living in a war where there is business and where there is war? What does it look like for us as teachers, as parents, to fear God? And how do we grow in our fear of God while the world is watching? I'll tell a story about what it looks like to fear God. This woman, Elena, from Ukraine, and her daughter, Sasha, They were in Toronto, staying in a train station for three days, stuck, no money, nobody to help out. 
Finally, in an act of desperation, she typed up on Facebook of their situation and just said, can anybody help? And a software developer happened to see it. And so he contacted her and said, we'll take you in. Already a family of six people. They went to the train station and took Elena and Sasha into their home, provided a place for them to stay, the, his own kids sleeping on couches, and took care for numerous weeks of their room and their board and drove them around, helped them get settled, and helped them find a job for income. I don't know anything about the religion of this software developer. I do not know. But what I do know is that act was a demonstration of what it looks like to fear the Lord. If you fear the Lord, it means you care more for others than you care for yourself. How are you doing at demonstrating a fear of the Lord? If you're like me, you struggle with it. You struggle with it. Because I know when I, there are opportunities to serve others, when I hear about others' tragedies and I have an opportunity to help, to serve, the first thing that comes to my mind is, what scam is going on here? And it's good to be wise as serpents, as gentle into do as doves, right? We've got to be both. But instead of going and investigating, of checking it out, I just can write it off and say, well, it's probably a scam. Fear of the Lord looks like striving to demonstrate his character of caring for those who are vulnerable and weak in our business dealings, in our conflicts, in our living. So my challenge to us as we approach Christmas, as we approach the birth of Jesus, is to grow in our fear of the Lord. What does it mean to fear the Lord? Now, some may say, well, that's not talking about like, <gasps> I'm scared of God. Well, that's not only part of it. That is part of it. It is a, a definite sense that God is someone to be feared. He is holy. He is righteous. He is just. And we are not. But it's more than that. It's a love connected to the fear. The language that is used to describe the fear of the Lord is often wrapped in the language of worship. It means we're called towards reverence, to revere God above all things, to fear Him more than we fear death, more than we fear the opinions of others. And we need to grow in that fear. How can we do that? I want to give six quick ways that we can grow from, drawn from Scripture. Grow in our fear of the Lord. One, ask God to grow your fear of Him. Just pray. Pray, God, would you help me to be a person who reverences you with greater intentionality, greater commitment. Ask God to grow a proper fear of Him. Two, stop comparing yourself to others. It's so easy as, as we're considering our holiness, as we're assessing our own relationship to God, to look to others, to look to the scammers, right? And say, well, I'm not, but I'm better than them. I'm not doing that kind of thing. So I must be pretty good. Well, when we stack ourselves up against others, we usually are going to come out better or worse compared to them. Stop comparing yourself to others when you're assessing your fear of God. Rather, three, Consider God's holiness. That's why we're going through the book of Deuteronomy. That's a benefit. We're learning about God's holiness. And in learning about God's holiness, we should be acutely aware of our, our failure, our lack of holiness. Consider God's holiness. Remember God's Jesus' own prayer in the garden or when he was teaching his disciples? He said, our Father who art in heaven, what's the next word? Hallowed. Holy. Holy is your name. That's how he started off his prayer. Jesus, who was perfect. As an example for us to be reminded at the beginning in our prayer life that God is holy and we are not. So three, consider God's holiness. Four, 
Examine your own holiness in the way that you love others, including your enemy. Are you loving others with your, uh, more than you love yourself? And your love for God. Are you loving God in, with your heart, with your mind, with your soul, with your strength? Examine it. Take time over the next few weeks leading up to Christmas. Take time to consider how am I demonstrating the fear of God in the way I treat others, especially those that I believe are mistreating me? How am I living by making God a priority in my life? Fifth, confess your failure. Don't just start getting up, pulling on your boots, and doing better. That's good. But start just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance. I'm sorry that I've failed to love others. I'm sorry that I've taken advantage of those around me for my own benefit, my own pride. I'm sorry I've failed to love you, God. Confess it. He already knows, but confession is good for the soul. And then last, trust His forgiveness. Trust when you confess that He has forgiven you. He has cast away your sin as far as the east is from the west. There is no more condemnation. He forgives. Why does He forgive? Why does He forgive? He forgives because of what Jesus did on the cross. And I want to close by reading a passage from Philippians because it really demonstrates how God, who is all-powerful, all-holy, all-knowing, all-present, how God became vulnerable. Jesus took the position of the most vulnerable in order that we can be forgiven of our sins, of our lack of fear of God. And the hymn in Philippians 2 explains this so well. And it gives it as an exhortation. So Philippians 2, starting at verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. So have this attitude, have this, have this way of thinking as you approach business, conflict, as you approach your relationship with others. Have this mind which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The language there in verse 7 that I read is he emptied himself, literally means this. He made himself nothing. Jesus became like nothing in order that we would be forgiven of our lack of fear of God. That's the gospel. That's good news. That's why we can celebrate because so much has been done for us. We are vulnerable. But Jesus brought himself to a point of greatest vulnerability in order that we could receive the forgiveness of our sins and the glory of of the love of the Father. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you, in seeing us as your people, in our failure to fear you, Lord, you, have, you didn't leave us in our state of depravity, leave us in our state of false courage. But Lord, you reminded us that we fall short of your glory and that you saved us through the work of your Son. His righteousness has been given to us, imputed to us, that we could come before your throne and we are welcome at your footstool. We thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your character that is steadfast. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you now uh, to stand and gather in a circle around the chairs and we'll have the Lord's Supper.